It is difficult talking about the Parasite Eve games as a series. The trilogy is loosely tied together by the words Parasite and Eve and not much else. And not even that, because the third one drops the name entirely, so yeah. Though wildly inconsistent, it's still one of Square's more interesting series with its blend of horror, action, and RPG elements, some more than others depending on the game. Released at the tail end of their golden years of the 90s, the series debuted with the likes of Bushido Blade, Xenogears, and Tobol No. 1 when Square was using that FF7 money to branch out from traditional RPGs. Though I can only give the first game a high recommendation, the other two still come recommended for specific tastes. The series, the first two especially, serves as a time capsule for survival horror's progression as a genre, so at the very least, it's an interesting set of games to talk about. So let's walk through the winding road of the Parasite Eve trilogy. Parasite Eve first started off as a book penned by Japanese author and pharmacologist Hideaki Sena. Sena's background in microbiology is apparent due to how the game revolves around the renegade mitochondria trying to take over the world. Of course, it's a little more complicated than that, but you're going to learn all about mitochondria playing these games. And, as someone who slept through his general education biology classes in college, rest assured, you do not need to give a shit about the natural sciences to enjoy the plight of our heroine, Aya Brea. The first game, which takes place in New York City, serves as the sequel to the book, which took place in Japan. Now, my policy on spoilers is such that I cannot tell you much about the book's plot, because part one's third act is so integral to the events of the book. However, before the game, the book was first adapted into a TV movie, and just like with Sweet Home, it was up on YouTube when I made this video. The first game was also adapted into a manga, if that's your thing. Mechanically, these games couldn't be much more different from each other, so we'll save the details for later. Part 1 was released in the fall of 1998 for the PlayStation 1, and its sequel came out two years later in 2000. The series then laid dormant until 2011, when a third game that's really more of a spin-off dropped on the PSP, called The Third Birthday. Parts 1 and 2 did well enough to merit Greatest Hits re-releases, so tracking down physical copies shouldn't be too difficult or costly. And when I made this video, The Third Birthday was still available in stores for 20 bucks, though I had to call around first. And unlike most of the games I've reviewed, all three of these are available digitally. You can download all of them on PlayStation Network for a couple of bucks. So if any of these games piece your interest, it shouldn't be too difficult to track down. But that's enough background information, let's dive in. If Chrono Trigger and Resident Evil had a baby, its name would be Parasite Eve. Screw nostalgia, this game is the total package. Solid real-time action mechanic, surprising level of customization and loot, a great, well-written story with interesting characters and excellent pacing, solid frame rate, and CG cinemas that still horrify. Parasite Eve might be Square's greatest non-Final Fantasy game for the PlayStation 1. It is certainly one of the shorter ones. That is unless you venture into New Game Plus's insanely huge extra dungeon. To boil it down, do you love the stories of Resident Evil and Silent Hill but cannot stand those tank controls? Do you like RPGs but find most RPGs from this era are just too damn long? Parasite Eve is your game. It is an excellent, one-of-a-kind experience that has mostly gotten better with age, and comes recommended to the retro and modern crowds alike. It is Christmas Eve, and NYPD rookie Aya Brea arrives at the opera with her putz of a date. I mean, this guy doesn't even open the door for her. Who taught this man how to be a gentleman? The couple arrive just in time as the opera starts. We get a moment to see that Square has made some strides in graphics since Final Fantasy VII when the lead begins her first song. Suddenly she makes eye contact with Aya and stops singing. And then Square does well in its promise of a cinematic RPG by brilliantly establishing the game's tone. Welcome to a world of science fiction, pretty women, and a villain that isn't afraid to slaughter by the hundreds. It is one of the all-time great video game openings. Its CG may be primitive looking, but it is still effective. It is also an excellent introduction to our heroine and our villain. I love the fact that Aya comes dressed fancy, but still brings her gat. This is a heroine I can get behind. Get out of here, you putz. After exploring backstage, the woman who we learned is named Melissa refers to herself instead as Eve. She then transforms into some insane monster, rambling on about the emancipation of mitochondria. Aya follows her down into the sewer where she unfortunately gets away, but not before you fight a giant lizard monster thing, because, you know, video games. 
Outside, we learn that she is the sole survivor of those who did not immediately flee. We also see that this exhausted woman has an awesome partner. <coughs> this concludes the first of the game's six days, and unfortunately, the momentum stops here. Day one is an excellent introduction establishing the game's tone, heroine, villain, and combat. Day two is unfortunately comprised of a lot of front-loaded exposition, one of the game's biggest sore spots. We learn more about Aya's partner Daniel, his estranged son Ben, and the rest of Aya's NYPD cohorts. We're given a couple menial tasks around the office, which are just really thinly veiled tutorials. Then you head to the museum and get a biology lesson that just about overstays its welcome. I can praise this story up and down for its pacing, but yeesh, things get really slow here. When I played through this game again for this review, at first I wasn't sure if it just hadn't aged very well, or if it just slows after the introduction, and I can confirm, it just slows after the introduction. Stick with it. Everything that's established here in Day 2 actually has a payoff. By the time Day 2 wraps, the stakes have been raised, and things start getting really interesting. FF7 was many things, but it was not a well-localized game. Upon release, its poorly translated script was one of the game's biggest criticisms. Parasite Eve's script is not quite as expansive, and it would appear that Square made sure that the dialogue was on point. They also kept things tight. Even during that slow spot in Day 2, they introduce a lot, but nobody rambles. And the characters shine because of this. Here's a great example. When we meet Daniel's son, Ben, we learn in a very brief conversation that Daniel is divorced, not exactly the greatest father, and that Aya's mother died when she was young. No moody soliloquy, no drawn-out inner monologue, just a casual conversation between two adults. I like it when an author drops little hints, subtly telling me, Hey, you should be paying attention, we're going to be developing our characters. It's also an example of somebody on the production team having the foresight to say, Why don't we focus on having a tightly written script instead of voice work? Yeah, Eve's fake opera sound ain't fooling anyone, but at least there's no Jill sandwiches. So while that first bit after the intro drags, at least there aren't any spelling or grammatical errors or horrid voice work. But I understand. The appeal of a game like this is shooting monsters and loot, and so thankfully after all this, there's plenty of action. And while it ain't no Borderlands or Diablo, there's a great level of customization to be had. Combat is an awesome combination of RPG and survival horror. Existing somewhere between Chrono Trigger and Vagrant Story, retro fans of the PS1 era will no doubt be familiar with Parasite Eve's style of battle system. Instead of having enemies on screen, however, you'll just enter combat in specific areas. It actually makes backtracking kind of annoying, and most areas have conspicuously wide open spaces, but that criticism can also be leveled against the much beloved Chrono Trigger. Combat uses active time bar style turn-based combat, and includes your typical status effects and magic called Parasite Energy. Naturally, the type of firearm you use determines your range and rate of fire, like handguns and rifles. I like how Parasite Energy is handled. Spells can be cast in lieu of typical attacks, but there's no item to bring back energy. Instead, it refills on its own, but just slow enough to keep things tactical. You gather experience points for leveling up and learning new spells, and extra bonus points that you can use to beef up your guns, armor, or attributes like active time or item capacity. And you'll be picking up a lot of armor and firearms in this game, each with different characteristics to consider. Each piece of gear has base attributes and bonus attributes, and this comes into play with tools. Tools are items that can junk a piece of gear for its bonus points. For example, this armor might be useless if not for the points in the right-hand column. Using tools properly means that by the end of the game, you'll have an insanely strong firearm and armor combination. Throw in perks like first attack or status effect immunity, and it's completely possible to build Aya up to be an unstoppable beast. That is until you get to the Chrysler Building, an enormous, 77 floor, randomly generated extra dungeon. You can carry over one weapon and one vest with you to the EX game, and the last few bosses were kinda easy, but holy shit, the Chrysler Building will put you on your ass. Completing the Chrysler Building is how you achieve the true ending, and it's a daunting task, but I was satisfied with the normal ending and felt it good to call it quits around the 30th floor. Beating the normal game took just shy of 10 hours, including time for taking notes. Tack on the Chrysler Building, and that's easily 15 to 20 hours, which is a compliment today. But actually, when Parasite E first came out, it was downgraded for being too short. Here's a great piece of trivia. Greg Kasavin, who will go on to make Bastion, a game praised for, among other things, its brevity, 
set of Parasite Eve in 1998, expect to finish the game all the way through in no more than 15 hours. Yep, right there at the top. Apparently, its short 15 hour length was the most noteworthy quality. Boy, times have changed, haven't they? Parasite Eve's visuals might be an eyesore, however, unlike a lot of early polygonal titles, the game runs at a very solid frame rate. Also, creature design is excellently grotesque, and again, though primitive, some of these CG sequences are just as unsettling now as they were back in 98. This of course doesn't apply to the retro fans, I'm singling out the modern gamers here. Don't let these old graphics scare you away from Parasite Eve. But of course, there are a couple things you need to watch out for. Reloading your gun is handled all wrong. In battle, there's no indication of how many rounds are left in your magazine, and the only way to manually reload them is to go to the inventory screen. It couldn't be more inconvenient. Usually, I was too focused on the battle, so my magazines emptied on their own, which ruined my strategy and left me exposed. Also, Aya runs kind of slow, and some fights take place in super tight quarters, leading to a lot of cheap hits from unavoidable attacks. Oh, and here's a tip that'll save you some time. At the end of day two, you go to Central Park. In the zoo, there is a locked door, and it's super easy to miss the key right here. If you don't stand just right, you'll skip right over it. I spent probably 30 minutes wandering around looking for the damn thing before I realized it was actually someplace I've already checked. None of the areas have maps, which is only a problem in the museum late in the game. It's rather winding and requires backtracking. It's super easy to get lost here. These gripes, along with that slow spot in Day 2, are the only criticisms I can give Parasite Eve 1. So Parasite Eve 1 comes highly recommended. Fans of horror, action, and RPG owe it to themselves to play this game. Its sequel, on the other hand... <laughs> Parasite Eve 2 is an interesting game, but not because it's good. Attempting to give the survival horror genre a shot in the arm it would soon desperately need, it falls short of doing so, instead crafting an experience that not only betrays the first game, but is a completely regressive, bandwagon hopping mess. And to be fair, the game does do a few interesting things with the way it handles its action. And I think on paper, Parasite Eve 2 might have been brilliant, but execution is everything. Square had learned a thing or two developing outside of their comfort zone, but they were in over their heads here. Throw in a story with terrible pacing, boring characters, a paper-thin and largely absent villain, bland music, unresponsive controls, an extreme emphasis on constant backtracking, and, above all, a failure to do anything interesting with the established world of Parasite Eve. It is a game I can only recommend to survival horror enthusiasts. Under no circumstances should you play this game over Silent Hill, Dino Crisis, or any of the Resident Evils of the time. It caters more to the action crowd. RPG fans would do better to skip Parasite Eve 2 and instead download Vagrant Story. So yeah, came out swinging there. I really did not care for Parasite Eve 2. But it isn't bad so much as it is a failed experiment. There are a couple really cool ideas here, but like I said, execution is everything. First off, say hello to Resident Evil style tank controls. And not only that, laggy Resident Evil style tank controls. They feel about as responsive as Silent Hills, but Silent Hill never had this much action. Also, to irritate longtime genre fans, firing your gun is holding square and pressing R, instead of holding R and pressing square. Yeah, relearning after years worth of Resident Evil and Silent Hill won't be easy. Now, the purpose of this was to add targeting to battles, and that's cool. I mean, how many times have you wasted ammo in Resident Evil not really being able to aim? Problem solved, right? Well, unless you're targeting an enemy, you pretty much can't hit it. And just because you're targeting an enemy doesn't mean you can hit it, especially when they're at your feet. And you still slowly turn to face them. You don't quick turn and lock onto them like in Silent Hill. I like that in combat, you can only access items you placed in your vest pouches. That adds a great element of strategy, but it's not enough. When the aiming works, combat is kind of fun, but it's often just a mess. It tries to fix Resident Evil's aiming problems, but unfortunately takes too much control away. And it's a shame they couldn't nail down the gunplay because there's a very heavy emphasis on combat. Part 2 takes place a few years after what is referred to as the New York Blockade Incident. Aya is now a neo mitochondrian creature hunter, or an MNC hunter, working for FBI Mist, which is nothing like stars, by the way. 
Your obligation as an MNC hunter is to hunt down and eliminate all monsters. This isn't exactly telegraphed to you, but at any given moment you can pull up your map and see which rooms are flush with monsters, and you're supposed to run around and clear every single room. Doing this will net you more battle points and experience. Experience is actually currency used to buy and upgrade new spells. With battle points you can buy new guns, stronger ammo, and upgrades. Unfortunately, this means traveling to these same locations and fighting these same creatures dozens and dozens of times. Every time something happens, every time some new objective is established, previously cleared rooms fill with enemies again. Now, weapon upgrades and magic upgrades are really fun. I definitely enjoyed getting new gear, but it don't come cheap. Right up until the very end of the game, they were seriously expecting me to backtrack all the way to the beginning and clear out enemies. You know what? Go ahead and give me a shitty ranking after I've beaten this game. You're not Metroid. This is ridiculous. But you'd never know to do this at first because every time you call HQ to save your game, your cohorts are always encouraging you to pace yourself and not to work too hard. But if I don't grind, I won't be able to afford new stuff. Jeez, Parasite Eve 2, make up your damn mind. There's also a problem with the setting. Remember that feeling in Metal Gear Solid 2 when it finally sank in that, oh, the whole rest of the game takes place on the big shell. That kind of sucks. Well, after the mall, the rest of Parasite Eve 2 takes place in this podunk little town, Dryfield. And while you eventually find your way into a shelter that doesn't at all look like, say, an umbrella laboratory, you're still backtracking to the surface all the time. Man, in part one, you went to the Central Park Zoo, Carnegie Hall, the subway, the streets of Manhattan, all over the place. Here, it's the mall, Dryfield, and that not umbrella laboratory. It's boring. And all the backtracking, they don't even give you good music to listen to. Let's compare some music. Here's the background music to the museum in Parasite Eve 1. And now part 2's most common place, Dryfield. This meandering guitar riff actually drags on for over two minutes. It might be the most boring music I've ever heard in a video game. It's not even trying to create tension. It might be worse than that one song from Rygar. And now let's compare battle themes. So here's part one. generic, but it's got energy. Now part two. Hey, it's an action game. How about some action, huh? Parasite Eve 2 is sorely lacking any sense of momentum or urgency. You arrive at Dryfield, and it's just swimming with monsters. You enter a bathroom and watch a woman transform into a monster, and instead of running back to HQ and being like, Holy crap, shit is fucked down at Dryfield, no one seems to care. You call your boss, and they're kind of like, Whoa, that's crazy. Well, let me know if it gets worse. A few hours later, I wasn't even sure exactly what I was doing. By this point in part one, we had the opera, we had Eve, my buddies at NYPD, we had the beginnings of an investigation. Here, I'm just running around the desert waiting for a villain to show up. Spoiler, there really isn't a villain. There's an attempt to establish something way late in the second act, and a pathetic attempt at a twist right before the final fight, where some dude from the beginning just shows up. Haha, <laughs> it was me all along! Well, that's cool. Who the hell are you again? How in the world is this a sequel to Parasite Eve? The game's multiple endings don't save it. If Parasite Eve was Square saying, let's make a game like Resident Evil, Parasite Eve 2 was Square saying, let's make Resident Evil. Combat has its moments, but it's pretty busted, and where part one had a great story despite lacking momentum at times, part two never really takes off, much less has anything resembling an interesting villain. As a survival horror game, it tries some interesting things, but it never really comes together. It doesn't hold a candle to what Dino Crisis or Silent Hill had brought to the table. Not flat out terrible, it is mediocre at best, underwhelming as both a genre title and a follow-up. If you want to plot the progression of survival horror games from Resident Evil 1 to Resident Evil 4, Parasite Eve 2 is an interesting cul-de-sac. 
Outside of that, it is difficult to recommend Parasite Eve 2. Which brings us to the last game in this loosely tied together trilogy, The Third Birthday for the PSP. The Third Birthday features a blonde haired woman named Aya Brea, as well as a few other characters that share the names of other Parasite Eve characters. Outside of this, there is very little to tie it to Parasite Eve. It betrays just about everything that had been established with the first two games, but at least they had the decency to drop the namesake. As a fan of the series, it's an incredibly disappointing title, but putting that aside means you'll find an interesting action game with a cool body swapping mechanic, tons of gear to buy and upgrade, enjoyable gunplay, and a serviceable cover system. It suffers from the common PSP problem of, God, this would play so much better on a DualShock tells a truly baffling story and has a shameful amount of pandering male gaze, turning our once already attractive tough heroine into a weak, vulnerable, hypersexualized joke. Recommended for action fans, but not Parasite Eve fans and gamers who value story, narrative, and character. It's best just to think of the third birthday as a standalone action game, because it's a pretty cool one. The plot has some ludicrous time travel and body swap thing that I never really could figure out and never really found very interesting. I have never asked myself, what the fuck is going on, more than when playing this game. What I did find interesting was how in battle you can jump around soldiers' bodies. When you inhabit their bodies, you also control their firearms. So for instance, you might be down on the ground mounting a gun to it, you can then jump to a sniper on a nearby rooftop and get a different angle. Otherwise, you'll be running and gunning down hallways as enemies warp in. Locking onto an enemy is a little finicky, but guns feel and sound satisfying, so it's always enjoyable when you're able to lock onto the enemy you wanted to. The cover mechanic is unfortunately automated. Approach a waist-high wall and Aya will automatically lock onto it and take cover. Uh, most of the time. It's another classic example of too few buttons and analog sticks on the PSP, and it leads to a lot of cheap hits and deaths. But combat is still fun thanks to an arsenal of weapons to buy and upgrade. So the gunplay and action were often a lot of fun when they weren't a little frustrating. But there's something that must be discussed. I've been saving the discussion of Aya Brea until now. If you're familiar with Parasite Eve's 1 and 2, you're no doubt familiar with Square's marketing campaign, the second one especially, pushing Aya to be more like Laura Croft. Well, forget all that. It's nothing compared to what they did to Aya Brea in the third birthday. Here's a popular image. You get it? It's supposed to be a dick! You probably didn't get it because it's so subtle! Apparently, being blonde, leggy, and braless wasn't enough. Her ass seems to find its way in almost every single cutscene. And this tattered clothes look? It's actually a game mechanic. The more damage you take, the more her clothes disappear. And after each mission, you have to buy back a fresh pair. Why was any of this necessary? What is this actually bringing to the game? And as a fan of games like Splatterhouse, I don't think I have to tell you that I'm no prude. I didn't have issue with collecting nude pictures of Jennifer in the Splatterhouse remake. I mean, yeah, it kowtowed to the fantasy of the nerdy guy with the super hot stripper girlfriend, but at least it worked within the conceit of that game's ridiculous universe. Here, it's just... Look at that girl's ass! Did you catch it? Her ass? She has an ass! It's right there! They not only overly sexualized her, they made her into some pathetic, vulnerable child, constantly overwhelmed by the events of a story that certainly feels like it wants to be taken seriously. It makes for an absolutely uninteresting protagonist. Like showing extreme emotion and angst somehow excuses a writer from actually explaining what's going on or giving characters any more than the simplest of motivations. Contrast that to Parasite Eve 1. When shit hits the fan, Aya doesn't buckle. She's a tough, confident woman and is good police. But she's not made of stone. When events force her to examine herself, she often has difficulty dealing with the burden of being the chosen one to defeat Eve. For some reason, she's special. In fact, in many ways, she's similar to Eve. And knowing this, she questions if she too is a monster, also capable of the same hideous violence. Her existential dilemma stands in great contrast to her tough-as-nails demeanor in battle, making her a heroine that's easy to both relate to and root for. In the third birthday, Aya gasps more than actually fucking talks. <laughs> and is either crying or looks to be on the verge of tears. It's pathetic. But at least they had the decency not to call it Parasite Eve 3, so... 
This all sort of gets a pass, and the third birthday gets a very low recommendation. When I wasn't shooting stuff or upgrading my gear, I was annoyed and confused. When I was shooting stuff, I was occasionally frustrated. So three games, all technically part of the same series. Part one is awesome and unique, gotta check it out. Part two was kind of disappointing, but not exactly terrible. And part three was pandering and confusing as hell, but still kind of fun. It does well dropping the Parasite Eve namesake. And so now I hope you understand why I said it's kind of tough to call this a trilogy, but at the very least, they're all interesting games to talk about, but that's enough out of me. Remember, all three of these games are available on the PlayStation Network, so if you have that option, go check them out. Until next time, though, cheers. Sorry, no jokes. Just that one time. Maybe next, maybe next, maybe next Halloween.